cetera, indicators, so lots of components. So Zoom now adds those components that are all mobile ready, integrated right in with the Canvas, which is nice. Um, now that brings us back to about the level of Flash. So if we have CreateJS for the organization and the events, and we've got the conveniences, and we've got the components, that's about where we were in the benchmark of uh, Flash when we made interactive media. But when I use Flash, I also developed with 90 custom classes that help me build interactive media better. Things like parallax, and damping, and going from page to page, all of these classes. So I was able to bring those in and sort of organize them properly, and bring these primarily controls uh, into, into Zoom as well, and into the canvas. Controls like a layout class. A layout class gives us the ability to do responsive design on the canvas. And you might say, oh, responsive design, we do that in CSS. Well, we've been doing it in code all, <laughs> all of code's life. That's where responsive design came from, from coding. Uh, it's now in CSS, but it came from coding originally, and it's very easy to do in coding if you have the proper library and the tools to do that. So we've got responsive design on the canvas now. So uh, I would call that, with, uh, with the conveniences, the components, and all these controls, uh, I would say that that's Web 2.0. You're not coming in saying, can I make calm? You're now coming in saying, okay, yeah, I recognize this stuff. Um, so what I'd like to do is take you through a couple um, improvements that we made. Because remember we said we can do it better each time. Uh, so we'll do that with the respect to the launches of Zim. Zim 1 gave us what I just talked about. Zim 2 is a Zim Duo. When you make a button, for instance, you have a lot of things that you have to specify on the button. For instance, its label, its width, its height, its color, its background color, uh, its corner, etc. And when you pass in parameters to make this button, that's how we do it, we pass in a bunch of parameters. There's 30 parameters to pass in to make a button. Unfortunately, if we wanted to just use the defaults and set a corner, we'd have to go null, 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 until we arrived at the corner and put zero. Uh, that just wasn't manageable. So in Zim Duo, Zim 2, we provided two ways to pass in parameters, the traditional way, and also as a single configuration object. And the single configuration object is just uh, an object with all squiggly brackets, and we say corner colon zero. Sound familiar? Sort of like CSS, squiggly brackets, corner colon zero. Well, yeah, it sounds like CSS, but in coding, we had that first. That's called an object literal. So CSS copied it from coding, not the other way around. So now that's how we can um, easily then uh, specify what buttons look like, what circles look like, etc. with this Zim Duo technique. <laughs> Made it much more powerful because we could provide more options and you would still have a way to build with those options. So uh, that was Zim Duo. In Zim Try, we introduced uh, async, asynchronous data so that we could, uh, we could uh, load data without reloading the page, much like Ajax. We also introduced Wonder, which gives you microstats. So we could find out how long somebody took to do something and which button order they pressed. That was neat. But we were also building a lot. Like we kept adding to Zim, adding, adding, adding. And there's a thing with frameworks called bloat. Have you heard of bloat? It's like when too much stuff gets added. So what we did, the third thing we added in Zim Try, or Try Zim, I like to say, the third thing we added was distill. What distill does is you set distill to true. You run your app, and then in the end, Distill spits out minified code of only the code you've been using. So not the whole Zim library. In other words, you can get an interactive logo, for instance, in 14K once it's distilled. And that's great. Now, I did mention that Zim was changing and adding and adding and adding. One thing that wasn't changing, it was a very important point, is CreateJS. CreateJS, the, the main library, the, uh, the base library, hasn't changed in two and a half years. And that's a good thing. And some people associate that with a bad thing. But it's not. They built it so well, and it's so complete, it's a base to build upon. I don't want it to change. If it changed, it would be Zim. And if it's not Zim and it changed, and I'm still making Zim, I probably have to change Zim because the base changed. So it's a good thing sometimes when a technology doesn't change. Sort of what James is saying. 
Okay? So uh, another thing about not changing is CreateJS's cache on billions of browsers. Okay? What that means is the Internet Advertising Bureau don't even count CreateJS library as part of an ad size. So in other words, you can get an ad in Zim for 14K when it's distilled. So, Zim 4. Zim 4, um, what we did is realize we had improved so much on CreateJS that everything was Zim. And we said all these, all these conveniences, rather than having them operate on CreateJS, such as Zim.dragCircle, we said, hey, let's bring those conveniences into Zim, into the objects, as methods, they're called if you're coders. And so now we can say instead of zim.dragcircle, we say circle.drag. Even better. So now we've got circle.drag. What about collisions with the namespace? Uh, the circle is a zim circle to start, so there's no collision. Right. Yeah. Um, now let's see. So uh, circle.drag has zim4. Uh, zim v, which is just launched as the code introduces a thing called dynamic parameters. Uh, we also introduced a particle emitter, you don't make fireworks, choo, 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 and, uh, and more things like that. And you would have to specify what particle to use. So when you specify what particle to use, uh, you don't always want it to be the same. Sometimes you might want it to be a circle, other times a square, or a rectangle, or a triangle, etc. So what, the, what Zim V introduces is a Zim V value. And the Zim V value is one of three things. It could be an array of options, such as a circle, square, triangle. And then when the particle emitter emits a particle, it looks at that array and it picks one. Okay? It could be a function. So the second thing that a Zim V value can be is a function. And this, this harkens to functional programming. So we're passing in a function as a parameter, such as a function to make a unique snowflake. So now when the particle emitter emits its particle, it runs the function and emits a unique snowflake. The third thing a Zim V uh, value can have is uh, an object, uh, a range object, so a min and a max, and whether you want integers, and whether uh, it's a negative range as well. So for instance, if you were going to drop a bunch of bombs in a game, you don't want the bombs to go every second. Here's a bomb, here's a bomb, here's a bomb, here's, you know, I think a bomb might be coming. So uh, what you can do is pass into an interval, uh, a Zim interval that is, you can pass in this third Zim V value of a range. And when you pass in the range, each interval it goes will pick from that range. So your bombs might go up every second and then five, five seconds, and et cetera. So that's very powerful. Um, the Zim V site has not quite launched. It's about to, uh, involving these characters here. And it will also feature five satellite modules, one being to work in 3D with 3JS, so bringing 3D models, one to work with Box2D in physics, one to do a game module where uh, there's a leaderboard and things like that. Now there's all sorts of things in Zim for games. We have these things called sprites. She's a sprite, and she's sort of animated. People have walk cycles or explosions or sprites. And in CreateJS, sprites were linked to the timeline. So the frame rate. In Zim, what we decided to do is disassociate that and use Zim Animate to control the sprites. That allows us to say how long a sprite will last. It also gives us the ability to rewind the sprite, to loop the sprite, to give calls to functions as, as, as you go through this, to, to wait. And so all of the functionality of animation we now have in the sprite. Uh, neat thing about it too is you can make it dynamic. It's called a dynamo, a dynamic sprite, which is a sprite that changes its speed and time. So that can be based on, say, where you put the mouse or a gamepad controller, and you can speed up and slow down sprites, as well as the backing. The backing is called a scroller, and the, the backing can speed up and slow down. You can put both of those into what's called an accelerator, and you can control the speed of your whole scene from one place. It's pretty neat. Um, so the game module, there's also a pizzazz. These are the five sort of satellite uh, modules. There's pizzazz, which is assets, vector assets, to make backgrounds and buttons for, uh, backgrounds and icons for buttons. And the final one is ZimSocket. ZimSocket is a multi-user uh, server that, uh, what ZimSocket does is it lets you do multi-user, such as chats, 
avatars, uh, shared coloring, that kind of thing, collective coloring, all from the client side. So all on the front end, nothing on the back end. It also, uh, there's a, a free Amazon Cloud hosting with uh, Node.js and SoftIO. Like so that is a, a sort of wrap up of where Zen is. I've been doing this for a long time. And with the conveniences, the components, and I mean the conveniences, we made 64 Zen bits. 64 examples of interactive media. And they're all on here. There's an extensive tutorial section on it. 64 bits. And we made Zim work with all of those as conveniently and simply as possible. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So with all these things, the components, the conveniences, and the controls, I think we can say welcome to Canvas 2. <laughs>